want you to open with me today, today's verse. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse uh, 16 to 18. I'm reading to you this morning just this verse out of the message uh, version. Message version is simply a paraphrase uh, uh, of your Bible into modern English. That's all it is. It's not that they didn't change anything. And I'm just reading this one verse, and it's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 to 18. Uh, we're in part two of a series that we started last week called God Encounters. And uh, this is we, our desire, our prayer is that through this season of prayer and fasting that you would have supernatural encounters with God. Amen. So let's read this. It says, wherever though they, and that they is speaking of us. That's us. Okay, so you can put that as you there. Wherever though they or us, when we turn to face God as Moses did. By the way, we're going to be talking about how Moses turned to God today. It says that God removes the veil. Now, that might not be a big deal to you, but in Jewish culture, that was a huge deal because the veil was the curtain that separated God from the people. And now he is saying, listen, that when we turn to God, God's going to remove that veil, that thing that brings separation. And it says, and there they are face to face. Then suddenly recognize that God is living personal presence he's not a piece of chisel stone in other words he's not that cross on your wall he's not a statue in the church he's ever present right that says and when god is personally present a living spirit that old constricting legislation what that speaks of is is the things in your life that you have not been able to break from that every time you turn around you're like it's still there this is that old constricting legislation it says it is recognized as obsolete so that addiction is recognized as obsolete. That problem, that stuff you've been de dealing with, right? It says we are free from it, all of us. Nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of his face. And so we are transfigured. That word is changed. We are transformed. And that's our desire that in this season of 21 days of prayer and fasting, that you go through it one way, but you come out changed. You, you go through it one way, but some, God does something so new, so refreshing, so supernatural in your life. You, you will shine. That's what it says. It says, much like the Messiah, our lives gradually, in other words, it doesn't happen right away, happens over time, becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. So today we're going to talk about what you believe about yourself. What do you believe about yourself? Because the truth is, I believe that most of us, even many believers have an incorrect view of ourselves. And what happens is, and, and, and I'll say this, that almost every one of us, almost every single event in our life, whether it was good or bad, has impacted or defined who we are. Every, everything that we've gone through in life is defined how we believe what we believe about ourselves, what we think about God, and even what we think about other people. Every single thing in our lives. And so most of us, maybe all of us, all right, the first thing that we do, think about this, the first thing we do when you get out of bed, what is it? Anybody? I know everybody wants to say brush your teeth, but before you brush your teeth, what do you do? You look at yourself in the mirror. You ever, does anybody do that? Everybody, everybody does that. Most of us do that, right? You look at yourself in the mirror. Even when you're passing by to go to the bathroom, you look at yourself in the mirror. Now, I don't know why it is that we do that. I don't know why, because, you know, it's when we're at, we look our worst. <laughs> you ever notice that? We're greasy, swollen, puffy, our hair's all over the place, but we... We're jacked up when we look at ourselves in the mirror. Some of us got bed marks on our faces. Some of us got dry saliva from when we... Come on, y'all know it's true. Y'all know it's true. It's the first thing we do. We look at ourselves in the mirror. Maybe it's because we want to make sure we're alive. Or we didn't have a Freaky Friday moment and we switched bodies with our teenage daughter. I don't know. But we do this. Every single one of us go to the mirror unless you don't have a mirror, right? And so what happens is we look in the mirror... And, and, and so what I'm saying, what I'm going to help you understand today is every single day of our lives, we have looked into the mirror of our life and we've, well, that's how we've based our own beliefs. We've based our beliefs about what we think about ourselves, our relationships, our parents, other people, our job. We have defined our lives by something. And the question I want to ask you is, what have you defined yourself by and how do you see God? How do you see God, right? But chances are, we have to a certain degree, they, there, there are areas in our life where, where God says to us, that's not you. There, there are moments in our lives where God looks at us and says, that's not who I've called you to become. There's something not right about you. And God says, that's not you. So if that's not you, then who are we? And anytime God encountered anyone in the Bible, 
Before God ever called them, before God ever gave them a mission, the first thing that God ever did, he's, he, worked on, he worked on them. He had to get, to get them to work on themselves. There was something about them. He said, I cannot give you this mission until you know who you are first. That's what God did. How many of you know, let's see, how many of you know Disney's very first animated cartoon that was a movie? Anybody know? She ate an apple. Snow White. Snow White and the Seven Drawers. Anybody know the year? For a candy bar? Don't know the year. 1937. 1937. But listen, Disney's, we all know the premise of that movie, right? We all know the premise. The evil queen, she hates her, her what was she, her niece, daughter, whoever she was there. And, and she goes to the mirror every single day. And what does she say? Mirror, mirror, on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? What, you know what she was doing? She was looking for validation. Every single day of her life, she needed this magic mirror to tell her you're beautiful. She needed this magic mirror to tell her, hey, you, you know, you're all that. Hoping that this magic mirror will, will tell her who she really is. And today, let me tell you something. We have a, a world full of people. Let me say this. A world of church people that have to go every single day, mirror, mirror, who am I? Mirror, mirror at my job, making sure that I'm validated at work. You know, but through the things I do, mirror, mirror on social media, I'm not getting enough likes. This is how we are. Mirror, 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 all this other stuff. And we're looking for something to define us. And we look at things to validate us, to bring us meaning. We look at our possessions, our positions, and our popularity. Three things that we look at in life. Believe it or not, you say, well, I'm not like that, Pastor. Really? We have three things that define us. For some of us, it might be our new house. Look at my new house. My career, my 12 kids. Right? Some of us. <laughs> but listen, for an entire generation, we look at others' opinions on social media to help define us. And it's a dangerous thing. And you might say, well, I don't have it all, Pastor. You've got to be careful because sometimes what happens, fake humility defines you. That defines you. Mirror, mirror. Look, I'm, look at those people. That humility defines you. There was a study that was conducted recently that found this. They found this had to say about people's identity and securities. And this study says that we look into one of three mirrors. The first one is the mirror of failure and rejection. In other words, it says, I am what I did. And that's three, these three mirrors are the things that people look to. I am what I did. So, so in other words, I drank, so I'm an alcoholic. You know, I used to use drugs, so I'm a, re, I'm a recovering drug addict, right? And, and I will tell you that what, what uh, the AA has done is a great, great, great thing that they do, the 12-step program that they do to help people. But here's the problem. You might have been an alcoholic 50 years ago and haven't drunk a, a drop in 50 years, but you still go to a meeting and you start the meeting by saying, hi, my name is Joe and I'm an alcoholic. And I get it. I get it because they want you to own what you did. I get that. But the truth is that the, by you confessing it, it's still a lie. Because you're not who God, who, you're not who God, you're not who that is. You're not that thing. And I, I listen, I expect, I understand that we've got to own the things that we do. I get it. But if you believe that you, what you did or what your parents did made you who you are, you will miss out on what, how, on how God defines you. I mean, we think about all these different things that we say. God never sees you by what you did. Listen, he always sees you by what you could become. He never sees you by what you did. He always sees you by what you could become. That's why when God looked at Gideon, who was the least of his clan and the youngest and the most unqualified person to go to, the first thing God said, he saw his end from his beginning. He said, almighty man of valor. God doesn't see you by how you define yourself. He, de he sees you by how he defines you, by what you can become. There's a phrase that I think that we all need to learn and use often, not just with ourselves, but even with our kids. That they, Listen, if you, if when they do something wrong, this might be what you did, and it's wrong, and you might have to pay for it, but it's not who you are. It's not who you are. So listen, if you're listening to my right, right now, maybe you're plagued with this thing. Listen, you might have to pay for it, but it's not who you are. It is not who you are. God will change you, and God will do an amazing work in your life if you let him. It is a lie. Here's the second mirror that people look through. It's the mirror of social pressure. In other words, we, we have to, we, we, we've let other people define us. I am who they say I am. I am who they say I am. And I be, can I say this? Some of us have had one statement made by one negative person in our life, and that statement has defined us. Just one statement. 
one statement. From one statement from a teacher or a parent, maybe it was a comment on social media, it has paralyzed you and made you believe that you are who they say they are. I can't tell you the number of people over the years that my wife and I have counseled who who, can't get past it. They cannot get past this one thing. Maybe they've said, you're too dumb to go to college, or you're too ugly, you'll never amount to anything, or I regret having you. All these things, guess what? The words are like poison. We get it. But what happens is they sneak into your heart undetected, and they become like concrete in your heart that can't be removed easily. And we believe these things. And, you know, Thomas Edison was told by a teacher, the teacher said to him, you're too stupid to learn anything. Well, he did not let that one statement define him. Thomas Edison became one of the greatest inventors of all time with more than a thousand patents held in the U.S. alone, revolutionizing everyday life with inventions like the light bulb and, of course, the phonograph, which we don't use anymore. But think about it. That one statement could have defined him from a teacher of all people, but instead he chose not to obey it and and say, you are not who they say they are, ladies and gentlemen. I think that too many of us, we compare our lives with everyone else's highlight reels on social media. Mirror, mirror. Can I, can I tell you something? That's not who they are. That's not who they are. You know that before they go to the mirror, they spend three hours putting on their wig and makeup so that you can see the fake them. Can I help you? Like, they're not going to show you the worst parts of their life. They're not going to show you when they first woke up and what they look like without makeup. But we think we want to define ourselves by that. That's not who they are. That's not who they are, ladies and gentlemen. The third mirror is the mirror of inferiority. By the way, this is still a mirror that sometimes I still struggle with. Let me tell you, as the youngest of five kids, you live your life trying to prove yourself all the time. You did. Striving to get on top like Jacob did in the Bible. That's probably why I like his character so much because we have so much to like. But, but you see, when, when I stepped into this role as senior pastor, knowing that the buck stops with me, that the pressure is here, that I make the decisions. And then, of course, you have pastors in, in the city that you know, and, and you start to look at, you start to compare and all these different things. Guess what? That mirror of inferiority I start to deal with. And at times you'll feel like you don't measure up, like you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not equipped enough, you're not qualified to do this. Go. Here are the voices that we start to listen to, and the voices, I'm not good enough or I'm not enough. That's what we listen to, I'm not enough. And I think some of us, a lot of us, we kind of feel this way that, you know, I'm not a good enough parent. I mean, I've messed up. I'm not, I'm not really qualified for this job. You know, I'm not smart enough to go and hang with those people. We, we, we disqualify ourselves from the greatest things and relationships and opportunities that God wants us because we believe that one lie of the mirror. And here's what I want to tell you. I, I, here, how do you find the right version of who you are? To find out what something is, you got, you got to ask the one that created it. How many of you ever gone to a museum or an art gallery and looked at a piece of art and you're like scratching your head like, what? In the, everybody else sees something amazing and you're like, is it upside down? I mean, do you ever, like I'll see some paintings and I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. And somebody's next to me like, oh my God, do you see the, I'm like, no, I don't see what you're seeing. But it's not until you speak with the author or the artist and they help you understand the inspiration for it that you begin to see it. You have to go to the originator to understand it. So ladies and gentlemen, you and I have to go to God, which by the way, God put everything in his word for us to understand everything he wants us to know about us is found in here. You will never live out your God-given potential without asking the one who created you. Never. God has the answers that you're looking for right here in the word of God. So you got to get in this word. I'm imploring you, listen, as my wife talked about soap, start soaping every single day. It's one chapter a day that doesn't hurt. It'll help you. It'll help you. That's why when we come to church, we sing songs that make declarations of who we are, who I'm. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm I'm saved. Right. That's why we make. That's why we come to church every Sunday. Why? To hear the word so we can get the word of God inside of us. Right. That's why we need to read our Bible every day, ladies and gentlemen, because when you do, I promise God encounters. God encounters. You start to believe something new about yourself. Amen. And I say, I'm not the same person I was when I first got saved. I am not. I'm still, I'm still not who I want to be, right? But guess what? I'm, at least I'm working on who God wants me to be. I'm working there. But here's how it is. It's little by little, word after word, 21 days after 21 days, prayer after prayer. Guess what? I'm being renewed and transformed by the word of God. 
That's how it's got to be every single time. Every t- so I, wanna, I want you to go with me. James chapter 1, verse 23 to 25. Look what, look what James says. He says, anyone who listens to the word. So look, you're sitting here in church right now listening to the word, right? He says, but anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So that means you will come in here and hear the word. You'll hear me preach the word and you'll go back out there and you'll go out back sinning, living your life like you didn't hear the word. That's what it says. But look what verse 25 says. But whoever looks intently, listen to me, that's my goal. That's my desire for you is that you would look intently, that you would be laser focused on the word this new year with a fresh start. Listen, in this new season of prayer and fasting and soaping and soaking and all the great things, if you would just give yourself to the word of God, look what it says. It says into the perfect law that gives freedom and continue in it. In other words, it doesn't end at 21 days. You continue in it, not forgetting what you've heard, but doing it. Look what it says. Look at the promise. They will be blessed in what they do. Come on. They will be blessed. You will be blessed in what you do. Who does not want this promise? And this is where Moses comes in. We're going to talk about Moses. Moses who struggled with his identity. Listen, from birth, guess what? They wanted to kill him. Pharaoh made a decree based because of a prophetic word. Let's kill all the babies under the age of two. So all the, they, were there, they were coming and killing the babies and throwing the babies in the Nile, but not, not Moses' mother. Instead, she, we know the story. She put tar and pitch in a basket, put him in, a, in the river, and, and, and put him down the river. And we know the story that as he goes down the river, Pharaoh's sister finds this baby. She takes him as her own, and he becomes a member of the house of Pharaoh. He becomes a prince of Egypt. Raised in the palace. I want you to see this. He's now raised in the palace. He's got the best of everything. The best education. The best money. The best food. The best clothes. All of that. But guess what? That still isn't who God created him to be. There's still a struggle inside of him. And I want you to know that. That you can go and get all the accolades and degrees and money and jobs. But if you still have a struggle inside of you. It's because you still have not become everything God has for you. Even when you think you've got everything you've ever wanted, even when you feel like you're successful, but you've not become what God has called you, you're going to be miserable. You'll be miserable because you've got this struggle inside of you, this identity issue. God, I've got to find who I am. And so Moses struggles with his identity, and he realized when he was, that one day he was not an Egyptian, that he's Hebrew. What a culture shock for him. I'm not? What? This is so different. Because at that point, he begins to realize that he was made for more. And we know the story. He sees a, a, an Egyptian taskmaster beating a Hebrew and he kills the guy, buries his body. And now because of that, he flees to the wilderness. He's running for his life, which is, listen, this is when, when you are struggling with your identity, oftentimes like Moses, you do crazy things and then you run. You do crazy things and then you run for you. I mean, you find different ways to, 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 to really kind of transfer that. But when you struggle with your identity, there are things that you do that are kind of out of order. And, and then you run. You just you run from God's presence. You run from people that can help you. You just don't want to deal with it. And that's what Moses did. And now Moses at 80 years of life is living on the backside of the wilderness with a bunch of sheep. Now he's spending his elderly days over there. Now, why? Why? Because he never really dealt with his insecurity. Because he ran from them. And and we know the story. What does he see? He now comes and he sees a burning bush. But it's not burning up. And it's talking to him. Now by now. Moses is probably wondering to himself. I should have not had those wild mushrooms last night. Because this this bush is talking to me. Right. He's like losing his. He's thinking he's losing his mind. Right. And, and, And now he's dealing. Now the bush talks to him and says. Hey Moses I'm God. Take your shoes off for the place where you are is holy. And, and, and what God begins to do, he, God begins to help Moses to deal with his insecurities so that he can call Moses. And I want to share with you four of Moses' insecurities that we deal with every single day in our lives. And the first one is this. He, Moses says, who am I? Who am I? In other words, I don't know who I am. I've been living with a lie. A lie. Am, I, am I an Egyptian? Am I a Hebrew? In Exodus chapter 3, verse 11 to 12, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go that I should go to Pharaoh? Do you know who you're calling God? I'm a murderer. I killed some. You want me to go? 
You, I've been spending my days with these sheep. You want me to go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, look what good, I love God's response. I will be with you. God's response will always be, you know what, Moses, tell me about you. But let me tell you about me. You can always count on me. I will be with you. I will be with you because Moses is not about you. It's about what I want to do through you. I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that this is who I've sent, that, that, that I've sent you. In other words, Moses, you think it's about you. This is, this is where we get caught up, ladies and gentlemen. We think it's about us, right? No. God says, I just need you to be a vessel, Moses. I came to you out here in the middle. I know what you did. I know exactly what you did. I know where you've been and who you've hung out with. I just need you to be a vessel. I'll take care of the rest. And that's great because that takes the pressure off, ladies and gentlemen. You think about when God calls us to start this church. God says, it's not about you. This is about a people that I want to reach. I just need you to be a vessel and I'll take care of the rest. That's what God is saying. It's about God's power, his power and his desire to reach lost people. Just be the vessel and I'll do the rest. And he says that when you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. By the way, just to prove that God doesn't call you based on qualifications, God God specializes in using messed up people to do great things. So if you're watching right now, you qualify. You qualify. You think about it. Paul was a murderer. He was chasing Christians and killing them and putting them in jail. And yet God used them to write two thirds of the New Testament. That's why Paul could say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 10, but by, great, by, by the grace of God, I am who I am. I was a murderer, but I am who I am. That's why I love God has such a sense of humor doesn't he that he think about your life god you want to use me for what you want to use me to do what to me think about you and then think about the sphere that god wants to bring you into the people is it me god i have a i have an amazing sense of humor and that's why you and i can say i am who i am by the grace of god i am who i am here's the second insecurity is who are you who are you and, I, and then you have to understand that people who struggle with insecurities also struggle with who God is. When you're not sure of yourself, you're not sure about who God is. You're not sure. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 to 14, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what is his name? In other words, who are you? Who sent you? Who sent you? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am sent me to you. And he's like, well, that's good and all. But really, Lord, who are you? You know what God was saying? You can't put me in a box by simply giving me a label or a title. My, bo my power is too great for you to simplify to a name. Will you just go and let them know who I am? And when you tell them I am sent you, they're going to know who I am is. We, we want, we got, we, when we're insecure, we always want answers that we think will bring us security. And God says, all I need you to do is trust the I am. Just trust me. Trust what I'm getting ready to do. Can I say this? I think that our lack of confidence in ourselves, our lack of confidence when we pray, our lack of confidence when God is asking us to step out in faith comes from a fact that we don't really believe that God is that big. The reason why we don't pray big prayers is we don't think that God can come through. That's an insecurity. The reason why we don't step out in faith and we've got all these, we've got all the reasonings, by the way, why we don't do it. It's because we don't believe that God can do it. We have this lack of faith. We, we don't believe that God, we don't believe that God can supply my needs. We don't that believe that God can take care of me if I do it. When I think about when we stepped out many years ago to do this, I thought that way. God, can you do this? And in my mind, I began to think of a plan B catch. How, how, how can we take care of this? And God said, I don't need plan B's. I am sent you. And when I send you, I'm going to take care of it. That's why I think we have too many believers that live in what I call safe Christianity. Come on, you know, safe Christianity where we have enough of God to go to heaven and stay out of hell. Come on, we got enough of God to, to go to heaven and stay out of hell. But we don't want the fullness of what God wants to bring to us because we're afraid. Guess what? We're afraid that that might make us weird. 
Or we're afraid that that might make us pay for, you know, that we're afraid of, of really going all in for God, right? So what happens is so we, don't, we don't serve fully. We don't give fully. We don't worship freely, right? We're the ones in church. We're like, oh, I don't know how you just kind of, I worship like this. And, you know, I hold the baby. I hold the baby. I hold the baby in worship. But let the Buffalo Bills score a touchdown. And you're like, right? You are crazy for the bills. But your God just saved you and delivered you, brought you through, set you free from drug addiction. You're like, I don't worship the Lord. I'm not like that. Let a check come for a million dollars in your house. (laughs) Be jumping through windows. Your neighbors will think you're crazy. But your God set you free and saved you. You're like, God wants to bring the fullness of who he is into our lives. But we don't do. And what do we do? We settle for a less than God than what God wants to be in your life. I said it last week. I'll say it again. You'll never experience everything God has for you until you go all in for God. You need to go in in such a way. Listen, it's for your own personal confidence. It's for your own. Listen, the land of safe Christianity is the land of confusion. You don't know if you can trust God or not. When you go all in, you know he goes all in for you. He goes all in for you. You need to know that you serve a mighty God, a powerful God that will not be put in a box. He is a miracle worker, and he wants you to experience the miracles in your life. But you will not experience it until you go all in for him. So I need you to stir it up today. Say, I'm going all in for Jesus, right? I think, I think listen, this is, this, is, this is true because I think you talk to believers, you talk to them about their trials. You talk to them about what they're dealing with, their discouragements. And I think that we have a powerless view of God. Like, God, yeah, I know God is powerful, but, you know, that God's too busy or he's not powerful enough to, to change my life, to save me, to provide for me. And so we've got plan B and C set up. And God says, you think about the Israelites when they were wandering in the desert for 40 years, they didn't have a plan B. And God said, every single day, I'm going to give you fresh food and fresh water. I'm not going to let your clothes wear out. And we're wondering what's going to happen next week. Oh, because we've got a new president. Give me a break. Your salvation does not come from Capitol Hill. It comes from the Lord. And you know why? Here's why. Because we primarily live and base our decisions in the realm of the flesh. The physical realm. And that's our problem because my God is supernatural. And when your God is supernatural, that's why we got to tap into the supernatural part. We'll never, until we do that, we'll never connect to the unlimited resources that God has for us until we step out of the flesh and step into the supernatural. That's why, listen, that's why fasting helps you. Fasting helps you connect with the supernatural part of your life. How many, I think I've told you the story before, the little girl that wrote a paper about Jonah to her teacher, about her teacher in class. Okay, I'll tell you. So her her teacher's... (laughs) Her teacher's an atheist, and this little girl writes a story about Jonah. So she turns in the paper, and the teacher says, this is ridiculous. A person cannot live in the belly of a whale for three days. And she says, well, teacher, when I get to heaven, I will ask Jonah all about this. And the teacher says, well, what if Jonah doesn't go to heaven? She goes, well, then you could ask him. (laughs) Right? So so, the supernatural realm. Jeremiah 32, 17. Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Look what he says. Nothing is too hard for you. So you want to know your answer? Your answer to, to, to who are you? Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing, Lord, is too hard for you. Here's a third question we deal with is, what if they? What if they? Mirror, mirror. What if they have something to say about it? Exodus 4.1, Moses answered, What if they do not believe or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you. This is where we are more concerned about what people think than what God has to say. Proverbs 29.25 says this, The fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. 
Even in Jesus' day, look, look at what the Bible says in Jesus' day, John 12, 42 and 43. Yet at the same time, this is speaking of Pharisees and, and those teachers of the law that wanted to become believers. It says, at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than the praise from God. Followers that wanted to follow Jesus but were afraid of the words or opinions of other people. And anytime you have feelings of inadequacy, insecurity, and inferiority, they will always control your life until you stop letting social pressure of someone who didn't even save you control you. They didn't even save you. And you have to, why do I have to listen to you? Did you die on the cross for me? Don't give into it. That's why Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. How many of you can say that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? You got to say, if you cannot say that, that's, that's what you have to surrender to today. If you cannot say that. And the last statement that Moses made is the statement we also make is I have never. Well, I have never, not that way, but I've never. And I think what happens is we always disqualify ourselves because we've never done it. We've never done it. We miss out on so much because we've never done it. Like I, I'll go out to eat with people and they won't try new foods because they've never had it. I'm like, that's why you try a new food. You're going to miss out on something great because they created an opinion. Well, I've, I've never, well, try it. You won't do new things because you've never done it. Now, I know there's some things that are dangerous. I'll never try it. But I'm just saying. You, look, look what it says. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. <laughs> Excuse me. He says, I have never been eloquent. I have never been eloquent. Neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? It is not I, the Lord. Now go. I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. Can I say that at the end of next month, we want to launch small groups, and we're asking people to be small group leaders. And here's what happens. I think what happens when we start making those announcements in church, a lot of people will sit in church, and they'll filter their decisions based on what Moses said. Well, I, I can't do that. Well, here's the truth. You can't do that. You, you can't do that. You're probably right. But you're exactly the kind of people that God wants to use. You're exactly. Can't you see by now that as we've been talking about Moses, that he didn't have it all together? He tried everything he could to disqualify himself and get himself out of it like many of us do. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I can't do that. I can't leave. I don't have time. I don't know if I can help people. I don't have nothing to offer people. We sit there and disqualify ourselves from something that God knows. Not, not, they're, they're, they're not just going to benefit from it. We're going to benefit from it. And we, we, we reason our way out of what we can do that God wants to bless us with. God knows, that God knows and sees things. He knows the end from the beginning and knows what you need more than what you think you know. And we sit there and we have all, that's the reason why we don't do certain things. And, and we quote scriptures like what I'm about to scroll. And we have bumper st stickers and, and we have our coffee mugs that says it. And, and the question is, do we believe it? Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We got t-shirts. Do we believe it? Do we believe that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you? Or is it just a great little coffee saying? Come on, we've got to think about these four things that God says, I, I've countered every single one with my word. You can do it. I know you feel unqualified many times. I know you feel like you've never done it. I know you feel like you've got the words of other people speaking over you, but I've healed you and I've delivered you and I've set you free. So just go all in for me, right? Come on, bow your heads, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, that during these 21 days of prayer and fasting, Father, I pray, Father, that you would confront, that you would heal every insecurity, Lord, every social pressure, Father God, every feeling of inadequacy with the truth of who they are in you, Christ. 
I pray, Father God, that someone will get set free from themselves, Father God, that you would help them, Jesus, to see you inside of them, Lord. Father, they're your sons and daughters, Father. And I pray, Father God, that you would give them the courage to step into everything that you want them to step into, Father. Lord, this year, I pray that you will take the limits off. Take the limits off, Father God. Lord, that as you, you say, go here, they'll go. If you say, say this, they'll say it. Lord, I pray, give them the courage to speak, the courage to act, that they will go, and, that they will go all in for you, Jesus. And Father, I, my prayer is help me to lead them according to your word so that they can be who they really are in Christ Jesus. God, we're trusting you for a year of miracles, Lord. But you're waiting for partners. And we're, we, we just gladly say, Father God, we'll partner with you on these miracles, Jesus. Listen, if you're watching right now online and maybe you're, or maybe you're here and you're sensing it's time to make a bold step. It's time. It's time to go all in. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's your giving. Maybe it's your worship. You got to go all in. You got to step it up. Maybe it's your commitment to Jesus that you got to step. Maybe it's your commitment to this house, and you need to step it up. Listen, and maybe you've been you've you've had you've exhausted every excuse to, as to why you don't serve, as to why you don't come to church, as to why you don't give. Listen, God says today is your day to step up. It's your day to step up. God says, maybe some of you have not been living your life fully for Jesus. You haven't gone on it, but listen, today you're deciding to do that. And I want you to pray this prayer with me, whether you're here or online. Just pray this prayer with me. Say this out loud. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for saving me. Today I put my faith in you. Would you forgive me? Change me. I surrender my life to you completely. I declare that I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, you believe that? Father, we thank you. We just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We worship you, Jesus. We praise you, Father. God, I thank you, Father God, that we will not deal with insecurity, fear, anxiety. Lord, we thank you that we can trust you for everything because we're choosing to go all in for you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said amen and amen and amen. Come on, somebody give God praise today. We love you, and we'll see you guys next week. Amen.